Hey, it's Patricia Murphy. It's Thursday. This is Seattle Now. No need to remind parents that students have been out of school for a year now. In a minute, we'll hear how it's been going from a high school junior and a pediatrician. But first, let's get you caught up. Seattle is getting ready to open its largest vaccination site yet. Starting this weekend, if you're eligible, you can head to the Lumen Field Event Center in Soto to get a shot. Vaccines are still pretty limited in supply. They're going to max out at about four or 5,000 doses a week for a bit. But Mayor Durkin says that number could go past 20,000 doses a day once more vaccines become available. A leading voice of Seattle's progressive movement is making another run for City Hall. Yesterday, Nikita Oliver announced their run for the open position nine seat on the city council. Oliver ran for mayor in 2017, but lost in the primary. They joined half a dozen other candidates already running for the seat, including senior council staffer Brianna Thomas and Fremont Brewing owner Sarah Nelson. And stranded West Seattleites and the people who missed them got some news yesterday. The city says it will reopen the high bridge to traffic starting in June of next year. March 23rd will be one full year since engineers shut the bridge down. Today, uh, my first order will close all K-12 through public and private schools in every district across the state of Washington. It's been a year, believe it or not, since schools around Seattle shut down because of coronavirus and thousands of our children joined the ranks of remote workers. Online school has not gone well. It's fueled academic and health issues. And policymakers have been in the news a lot talking about education. But what are students and doctors saying about this milestone? Terrible. <laughs> um I'm very, 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 very extroverted. Um, I love talking to people. I love people in general. People are my lifeline. People, I rely on people every day to help me with things. That's Lynn Strober-Cohen. They're a junior in the Seattle Public School District. And Lynn told us a year without school has left the missing normal interaction. Like being able to talk to kids in the hallway, being able to have lunch with my friends. I'm getting kind of to do that normal high school shtick. Um... I really miss it. And isolation from the pandemic is really compounding existing mental health problems. Teens are a demographic that we pay attention to. And a new study says that health care claims found that the number of teenagers who were looking for mental health care doubled during the early months of the pandemic compared to the year before. It's been really challenging. My anxiety has been all over the place. Um, I've struggled with depression just because it is so different from, like, it was so normal, and then it wasn't. And it was kind of like being told, like, you basically have to rewrite your life. And child health experts agree. They've seen an increase in depression and anxiety among students during the pandemic. I called up Dr. Dimitri Christakis from Children's Research Institute, where he directs the Center for Child Health, Behavior, and Development. He also edits an online medical journal called JAMA Pediatrics. Dimitri, thanks for taking the time. Pleasure to be here, and thanks for covering this important topic. Yeah. What does the research show about how young people are faring during the pandemic? Well, the early results are are frankly concerning. We have seen uh, that children nationally are falling behind more in math than in reading and more in communities of color than in uh, non-communities of color. And the most concerning thing of all, uh, Patricia, is that all of the assessments that have been done nationally are finding that there are about 25% of kids that they're not reaching at all, which is to say there's a sizable percentage of children that aren't even being assessed. And one rightly worries even more about them because they're probably the most vulnerable of all. That's on the cognitive side. On the social emotional side, uh, we are seeing, I think, the tip of the iceberg. But even that tip suggests that there is increase in anxiety, in depression, in isolation, because it's really not natural for children to not be around uh, other people any more than it's not natural for grown-ups to be. You know, there is another side of this because I also have heard from young people who appreciate not having that social pressure in school. We all joke about 
you know, introverts in Seattle. But there is truth in that. So I wonder how isolation does affect young people. For a small percentage of students, the distance learning model is better, is preferable, precisely because they do face a lot of social challenges at school, and dare I say, even in some extreme examples, bullying. But the solution to that, in my mind, is to fix the problem at school and not to keep them out of it. So, you know, if there's anything good that's come out of the pandemic, it's really torn a scab off of the wound that is the school system and its inadequacies, both in terms of the disparities, right? Because we've known for a long time that our schools are not equitable in terms of the opportunities they present children. But that's been made incredibly obvious during a time of distance learning. So I think we should use this as an opportunity to reimagine schools because we're going to need to do that. The children when they go back are going to have all kinds of needs that didn't exist before and that schools aren't prepared to deal with. But the most important thing is we need to get kids back in school as soon as possible. Where are teens losing socially when they're not in school? You know, it's interesting because before the pandemic, many of us, myself included, were actually concerned about the fact that children were spending too much time developing social relationships online. Because one of the things that happens when teens uh, engage in social media sites, particularly if it's a sizable percentage of their time, is that they um, have kind of unnatural uh, experiences with peers. They they present and see what some people have described as curated lives, right? You don't relate the actual experiences you're having. You tend to put your best life forward for obvious reasons. And even in the pandemic, I think that's a lot of what's happening which can lead a lot of children to feel that they're faring a lot worse than their peers are, which can compound their sense of anxiety, their sense of inadequacy, their sense of isolation. Dimitri, we hear it all the time that young people are resilient. It's just almost a catchphrase at this point. Oh, young people, they're resilient. How do you see that showing up in young people? How do we know that? You know, I I like to think that children are both adaptable and resilient, But the extent to which they uh, can do that clearly varies. Some children are more resilient than others, and some children are more adaptable than others. And the truth is that mild stresses in children's lives are good ways of building resilience. But the kinds of stresses that some children are experiencing in this setting are what we would call toxic stress. And toxic stress, particularly for a long period of time, is extremely damaging, uh, not just to children's psyche, but actually to their biology, to the way their minds work. I think we need to be prepared both for the possibility, for the certainty that many children are going to be behind cognitively, socially, um, but we also have to be prepared for the the very high likelihood that the disparities that existed pre-pandemic are going to be exacerbated considerably. And then compounding that is going to be the increases in depression, anxiety, in many cases, grief. And Dr. Christakis says one of the best things we can do for students is get them back into the classroom as soon as possible. I would love to go back. I would love to have a senior year. I'd love to go to have a prom, maybe have a little, maybe date someone, you know, have a normal high school life for a little bit. But I hope it for other people too. Because school was a lifeline for so many people. And parents, we haven't forgotten about you. Get in touch. Let us know how online schooling has impacted your household. We're at Seattle Now at KUOW.org. Seattle Now is produced by Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Claire McGrain, and Jason Pagano. Jenny Cecil Moore produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.